player you go. You know, was it was it good? Was it evil? Was it you know positive? Was it negative? And so that is a pretty uh, prominent debate that occurs amongst historians. And so what we want you to do is kind of enter into that debate. Now, in order to do that, what you have to do is you have to know what happened. And chapter 13 in your textbook, and those readings and our discussions in class should help you to find out what happened. And then after you know what happened, you have to be able to sort of assess whether or not you think you know, it's positive or negative. And so there are going to be specific kind of uh, charges, if you will, prompts, if you will, about Jackson and his followers that you would have to address. So on Friday, we're going to do that. You know, we have you know, a list on the back of the things to do list of like accusations against the Jacksonians. And then in class, what we'll do is we'll say, OK, if we had this accusation against Jackson and his followers, what would be evidence that would be relevant to this, either for or against? Right? So that, that's what we call categorization. So you're going to categorize the evidence underneath the charge. And then we say, OK, now based on this evidence, what do we think? What could we say? You know, what could we say to, 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 to prove or disprove this, this accusation? Right? And so ultimately, that's what we want you to do on the test. Now, the, the charges or the accusations against the Jacksonians are going to be different on the test than what we do in class slightly. Right? And that's always a problem because you know, anytime we do something like that, the people tend to, to kind of try to respond to the way they did the day before, you know. But I mean really what we're doing is practicing, you know, practicing categorizing our evidence and then utilizing it to support a contention for or against or whatever, right? So that's what we're going to do on Friday. So you, some of you are going to miss that. I mean, our dear friend, what, 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 my friend, what is your first name? Heaven. What is it? Heaven. Heaven. Heaven, our dear friend, Heaven has helped us these two days. I don't know if she can help us on Friday or not, but maybe Mrs. Cole, if you are unable to do it, would be willing to come up and, and help us. And Heaven has been nice and, and uploaded those the past two classes. They're both on um, our YouTube site. And I noticed there are only four views, and I think one of them was mine. So that, that's down to three, right, on, on those. But I did teach the class that I'm going to teach today on December 5th last year. And that's on there. It's a really good tape. It's December 5th of last year. It's the same discussion you know, that we're having kind of today across the way. And so, you know, you can watch today's tape or that tape, or, you know. So we'll have uh, Friday at least on there, and hopefully that will be helpful to you. Now, that all being said, where we were in our conversation is we were, we were talking about the rise of the common man in, in, in politics in this time period, and we said, that's ultimately what the test is going to be about. However, these other things, westward movement, westward expansion, urbanization, immigration, and industrialization, those other things are happening at the same time as the rise of the common man, right? So, so we are in the antebellum period. We are in the period 1815 to 1860. Jackson bursts onto the scene um, in 1824, and he is the president until 1836, and then Van Buren takes over in 1836 to 1840. But the Jacksonian era and the rise of the common man in politics is a part of this time frame. But as Jackson is dominating politics and his followers are pursuing an agenda, also what's happening is westward expansion. Also what is happening is urbanization. Also what was happening is a rapid influx of immigrants. Also what's happening is industrialization. So now Jackson's actions and this increased democracy is superimposed over these other things. And we started to talk about those things a little bit um, yesterday. Now, I would like to say this. On a, in, overall, overall, what we are talking about is a transformation. There, there you go. The kids are coming. Let's see how nice. Right? See, this is what they do to me. I, not only do the kids don't show up for class, but we walk in the halls. It's the AP test, Wallace. Um, yeah, yeah, so go ahead. Let's get them through there. Yeah. Uh, they'll only come every now and then. We'll give them a test on something they had two years ago. Uh, in, in, in biology and they'll do poorly and then we'll say it's your fault. 
right? And so, so, all right. Anyways, um, um, uh, what were we talking about uh, before, before those kids interrupted us? But anyway, it will come back to me in a minute. So, so um, you know, we wanted to talk about these. Oh, I know what we were going to talk about. The overall transformation of the time period. And, and this is ultimately what we're talking about, is urban or is rural agrarian to urban industrial. Rural agrarian to urban industrial. So America starts out as a rural agrarian country where most people are living in the countryside and working on farms. By the turn of the 20th century, most people are work living in cities and working for wages in factories or related industries. That transformation is significant. And it starts in the immediate aftermath of the War of 1812, but it culminates at the turn of the century. And that's to some extent what we're talking about here. We're talking about westward expansion, urbanization, immigration, and industrialization. This internal development, this, this, these changes that are transpiring. You know, and you know that's what we were talking about to some extent yesterday when we concluded. We were talking about westward movement, movement of settlers westward, and we said that during this time period, it happened to a greater extent than I should say, uh, it happened more rapidly than it happened in the past. You know, the people pushed the frontier very quickly. Settlement, you know, was very rapid. You know, expansion was very robust during this time period. And one of the reasons for that is the transportation revolution. And it's interesting, you know, the transportation revolution is, is, is an interesting terminology. You know, I mean, really you could say this, that what defines this time period is significant improvements in transportation. But generally it's referred to as a transportation revolution because the improvements in transportation during this period are so significant that they literally revolutionize the way that things are in America. You know, the, 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 the commerce, population, you know, distribution. You know, everything is influenced by these improvements in transportation. And we mentioned yes, some of them yesterday, Spence. We mentioned um, improvements in steam technology, the steamboat, you know, Robert Fulton to Claremont, and you know, steam steamboats going up the river, and how this connected the north to the south, you know, the south to the north more than the north to the south, because the north could always, you know, get get freight and products to the south because most rivers flowed north to the south, but you couldn't get things back up. And so steam technology improves this dramatically. You know, so, so, so we talked a little bit about that. But the most significant transportation innovations of this time were east-west, were east-west. And that's because that was the previous challenge. I mean, you could get from north to south on the Ohio or the Mississippi or other rivers. But if you had to get from east to west, this was increasingly difficult. And so much of the transportation improvements of this time period that were so significant connected the east and the west. And really there are three. One is roads and turnpikes. And they're not necessarily paved roads as much as they are crushed gravel and road, you know, solid enough to improve wagon transportation, significant enough that there were turnpikes and other kind of national roads that might have been maintained and connected east-west locations. I mean, roads and turnpikes are there and are important part. And eventually, those roads and turnpikes are going to turn into actual paved roads for automobiles and be significant. But at this point, they are not nearly as important as canals. Canals really starts a boom of transportation connecting the east and the west. And the canal boom of the 1830s and 1840s is largely attributed to the success of the Erie Canal. Everyone at least has heard of the Erie Canal. In fact, you might not know much about the Erie Canal, but everyone has heard at least of the term Erie Canal. Does anyone besides the instructor know what two cities are connected? 
impacted by the Erie Canal. Anyone beside the insurance? If I were to ask, let's say, Kronk, do you think, Kronk, do you have enough? Two cities, both of them are in the state of New York. The Erie Canal is entirely within the confines of New York. It connected what two cities? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it connects the Hudson River to Lake Ontario, maybe. Oh, yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Well, that kind of intelligence, you don't see that often. United States. Um, and Kronka is correct. It does connect Albany and Buffalo. Buffalo on Lake Ontario, Albany at the, at the headwaters of the, uh, the Hudson River. And um, this was significant. Let me, let me show you just something. It's not a very good map. But let me just show you anyways. I mean, Buffalo is probably about right here. Albany is probably about right here. But the significance of Albany, New York is it was, you know, 100 miles north of New York City, but it was navigable. It's on the Hudson. So the Hudson is navigable from Albany south. So if you could get things to Albany, you could get things to the sea. And if you get things to the sea, you get them anywhere. Right? So now, if you can get things to Buffalo, Buffalo, you can get things to the city. So all of this area now becomes accessible to the Atlantic Ocean via the Erie Canal. I mean, the Erie Canal is huge. I mean, hugely important. It's 363 miles long. It's amazing. They built it in seven years, eight years, 1817 to 1825, entirely within the state of New York, financed by, by the state of New York by private investors who bought bonds in the Erie Canal, financed in the state of New York. It was profitable. Its investors were paid back. It worked. It was very influential. It made New York City. Now, what's interesting about it, you know, I don't know why the Erie Canal interests me, but it does. Right? It does interest me. And, and, and I think the reason is, I mean, it's the whole concept of a, a basically a ditch, 363 miles long, is interesting. I mean, it's a ditch that filled up with water. And then barges that, that haul freight were actually pulled by mules. The mules were on the side of the canal, right? So, you know, if you had a barge, the barge was on the canal, and they had ropes on the mules, and the mules would pull the barges. Now, how fast could they possibly go? But the time frame of transporting freight went from 20 days to 8 days. And the price fell from over $100 a ton to like $5 a ton. I mean, so the Erie Canal was enormously influential and very productive. But what's interesting about it is the success of the Erie Canal inspires other localities and other places to try the same thing. So we get a boom. I wish I had an illustration. But if you look kind of all over the north, you know, uh, west here, the northeast, are these canals, right, that connect two places and there's a hope that that those canals would bring the kind of prosperity that the Erie Canal brought. None of them are, are really as successful as the Erie Canal. Most of them really aren't successful at all. And the canal boom is very short-lived. What quickly replaces the canals are railroads. Railroads become the preferred way of connecting the east to the west. The railroads are superior to the canal. I mean, there, there are challenges with the railroads, to be certain. But there are some superior in the canals that railroads can virtually go anywhere, right? You know, railroads can virtually go anywhere. Canals could only go places where there was a topography and water and, you know, I mean, you couldn't send a canal over the mountains. You know, I mean, how's the water going to go, like, up the hill? You know, I mean, it's, you, see, you can't do that. So it had to be, you know, connecting bodies of water. But railroads could really have a far, you know, uh, 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 more versatility than canals, and they very quickly replaced canals. I, I, the Erie Canal is still in existence today. I mean, I, you, you drive over it, it freaks me out. I don't know, probably won't do anything to you, but I see a sign that says the Erie Canal, I feel like I should do something. You know, I feel like, what should I do? I mean, it hurts. I can say it's the Erie Canal. I mean, should I, should I get out? Should I take a dip? You know, I, what should I do? I, I mean, um, it's like when I cross the Mississippi River, I feel like, well, I can do something. I, I just can't go across the Mississippi River without 
you know, I have to do something. You know, I have to stop. I have to, you know, uh, touch it. You know, I have to save the Erie Canal. I, now, interestingly enough, you can vacation on the Erie Canal. So you can rent like a houseboat, and you can travel up the Erie Canal and stay at various places along the canal, and then they put bikes on these houseboats, and then you can take your bikes, bikes off and then bike into the towns and the, and the cities there. That, and cities sprung up, you know, Rochester, Elmira, you know, they were all Erie Canal towns. You know, so that's, uh, I talked to people that did it, they, they really liked it. So uh, beyond that, I mean, I think there are bike trails that run on these canals too, because oftentimes, you know, the horses or the mules run the sides, so it's all flat. So I think railroads eventually maybe utilize those and now bike trails and you know things for people. But the canal boom is romantic, it's interesting, but it's quickly replaced with the railroads, who by the eve of the Civil War, there are 35,000 miles of track in America in Broadway, and further connecting the East and the West. Now, the, the transportation revolution certainly influenced westward expansion, but it touches everything. Touches everything. It certainly is influential in urbanization. So last night I was looking at these numbers when I was reading this book, and I was, I was looking at these numbers. And the author of this book, well, let's have this book back here. The author of this book suggests that the um, urban population between 1820 and 1850 grew from 7 to 18%. So this is out of the total population. So the total population of people living in cities of over 25,000 was 7% of the population in 1820. It went up to 18% of the population in 1850. Now, that doesn't seem like much. I mean, because what we're saying in 1850 is only approximately 20% of the people in the country lived in a city of over 25,000 or more. But it represents the most rapid urbanization in American history. So never before in American history had so many people flocked to cities in such large numbers, right? So, so this does represent, you know, the growth of cities. I mean, look, by, by um, in 1820 there were five cities in the United States that had over 25,000 people and only one city that had 100,000 people in 1820. By 1850 there were 26 cities that had over 20, 25,000 people. And there were six of them had over 100,000 people. So you, you really do have a significant growth of cities during this time period. And urbanization is one of the trends that continues through this century, that people are moving increasingly from the countryside into cities. And that trend is certainly you know, facilitated by the transportation revolution. You know, the reasons that cities grow is because they can. And they can if they can get access to goods and services, food and other things to, to, to you know, sustain the, the population. Right? I mean, if you think about it, hey, look, 8, 10 million people live in New York. How many of them today? How many of them feed themselves? I don't think any. So then you've got to get food into the confines of what is now the New York City for 8 to 10 million people. Well, I don't know. You know, there's a transportation network, there are trucks, there are other things that supply New York City, and New York City supplies things to the outskirts of the world, and that's how it works. But really, that transportation is, is, is enormous, and, and, and the movement of food and freight and other things is enormous in the growth of cities. So it's not an accident that the transportation revolution corresponds with rapid urbanization. In addition to rapid urbanization, we also have in this time period immigration. Now, it is certainly true, I keep forgetting that this, that Kevin is trying desperately to keep uh, me in the tape there. I'll, I'll try to stay in the middle of your head. Um, it is true that the history of the United States is the history of immigration, right? That there's always been people coming from other places to America, you know, largely from Europe, you know, to, to America, and this has been true from the very beginning until today. And you know, people continue to come to the United States today and they continue to migrate here from all over the world. You know, so immigration is American history. Um, and certainly there have been time periods of, of mammoth immigration. For, for, for Western Pennsylvania, you know, Western Pennsylvania uh, grew, you know, in, in, in terms of immigration between 1890 and, and World War I. A large number of immigrants came here from 
from Southern and Eastern Europe, but really that immigration still very much influences this region, right? I mean, probably half of us in this room, if we if we traced our ancestry, would trace our, our, our forefathers to that time period. I mean, there are, you know, other people that, that have other stories, you know, how, how they came, you know, into this area, but that certainly there was a huge influx of immigrants to this area at that time period. So there have been these time periods of mammoth immigration, but the largest percentage immigration in American history is the 1840s and 1850s. So of all the periods of, of, of large-scale immigration, the largest was 1840 and 1850. Over 4 million immigrants came as a percent of the population. That was the largest ever. And, you know, they, they, there were two large groups that came in that time period. Does anyone besides the instructor have an idea of the two ethnicities that came in large numbers in those time periods? Uh, uh, Kendra, you are a specialist in immigration. Do you have a thought? Um, is it Irish? Who well, was the Irish? It was the Irish. They were the largest group. Uh, you know, the Irish were are, are interesting. You know, t today, we very much, I think as a, as a nation, celebrate, you know, kind of Irish heritage. You, you don't find many people out there that are embarrassed of being Irish. Right? You know, most people that, that trace their ancestry back to Ireland are very proud of it. To your friend Mr. Whelan, well, he doesn't look like an Irish person, uh, he does. Look like an Irish person, and, uh, but, but uh, and Mrs. Marston, they, they're very proud of their Irish heritage and you know, very enthusiastic about it, you know, off St. Patrick's Day. But Ireland was a horribly impoverished place. You know, in your textbook, there's one of those yellow boxes, you know, and I'll tell you about it because you'll never, you know, no danger of you reading that. But I, I mean, uh, it's one of those yellow boxes in your textbook. A guy is recounting, he says, I've seen the slaves in chains. I've seen, you know, the Indians in the field. But I've never seen any degradation, any poverty, any misery, the level of Ireland. I mean, Ireland was just this impoverished place that in 1845, it got worse because a, a, a a blight killed a third of the potato crop in Ireland, which was enormously important to sustain the people there. And they had just a famine of epic proportions, and hundreds of thousands of people starved to death in Ireland. According to your textbook, they found emaciated Irish laying on roadsides with grass in their mouths, dead. And so it was that kind of famine in 1845 that was a huge impetus. To, to, for people to leave Ireland and migrate to all over the world, but largely to the United States. And that, you know, if you're thinking about this, and I'm sure you're not, but if you are, you might be thinking, oh, they're starting poor. How'd they get here? Well, there are really two explanations of that. What the Irish would do is in their impoverished state, they would, they would, they would pool their money together and send their youngest and strongest. So here is the Frank. Frank's the, one of the young men in the Irish family, and the Pat family gets together and they say, okay, we're going to pull all our money together, we're going to send Frank to America. Now they could do that because of the transportation revolution. Right? I mean, they could do that because it was inexpensive now because of steam technology to go across the ocean. So we send Frank over here, and Frank makes it to New York City, Boston, Philadelphia. He gets a job, menial labor, saves his money. Then they bring over Kromka, right? He comes over, and he's part of the family, too. Then they bring mom and dad over, and they bring the other people over, and they basically work their way here. Now, what's interesting about that is once they got here, they were so poor, they couldn't leave the place that they landed. So most of the Irish that came to New York stayed in New York. At one point, there were more Irish in New York than there were in Dublin. It was the largest Irish city in the world. New York City. The, the Irish were just so poor, they couldn't go into the hinterlands. They couldn't acquire land. And so they, 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 the huge influx of Irish came and they just worked, you know, at menial jobs. Most of them were agricultural people in Ireland. And they sought when they came here to buy land, but they didn't have any money to buy land. So they came and they just worked at menial jobs, backbreaking labor, domestic servants, and flooded the market, drove wages down. Um, you know, the, the other thing about the Irish, too, is they were dirt poor when they came, and they were Catholic. Now, the idea of a huge influx.
influx of Roman Catholics is not something that you would even think of today. You know, oh, so many Catholics, there are lots of Catholics out there, right? But in 1840, many Americans, native born Americans, Protestants, believed that Catholics were incapable of Republican government. That Catholics were a part of a hierarchical church that was led by a dictatorial pope, and that they didn't have a tradition of self-government and voting and all of the attributes that were necessary to have Republican government in America. They would be easily exploited and they never would be loyal because they would always be bowing to a foreign vote. They would always be bowing to a foreign pope. Now you might say, my goodness, that's ridiculous. Really? They, they really believe that the Catholics represented a dangerous threat to freedom and democracy? Yes, they did. And nativism, the idea of America for Americans, stopping immigration, discriminating against the people that are coming in, making sure that America remains pure from all these influences, is something that you see and hear about today, right? You know. But it was very prevalent against the Irish. The Irish were heavily discriminated against, demeaned, you know, um, you know, feared because of their religion and because of their poverty. Look, now I always tell people that one thing that strikes me is there's a famous cartoonist, and his name is Thomas Nast, and he, 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 he drew cartoons in and around this time period. And his cartoons are famous. You see them all over the place. You know, you know, we'll look at a few of them. Um, one of the things, when he drew an Irishman, he always depicted their faces like monkeys. Now, if you think about it, that's when you dehumanize them. When you draw their face like a monkey, basically you're saying they're less than human. And that's how they drew the Irish. Right? So the Irish suffered the enormous kind of wrath of Native Americans and fears. And one of the reasons was because they were so you know, uh, confined to such small areas, they, they, they didn't go out. So it appeared as if they were overwhelming America in the places that they were. Now, the second group that comes in large numbers comes almost in equal size, but they don't seem nearly as, as troubling, and they are the Germans. Um, the Germans came in large numbers, and, and, and they were different than the Irish in that they usually had money. The Germans usually had some element of money. They might not have been rich, but Kendall often the Germans were fleeing persecution, religious persecution, fleeing conscription, the draft. They had money. And so the result was that once they got here, they were able to keep going. And they went into the interior into the United States, and you find German populations all through Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, up into Wisconsin, Minnesota, down as far as Texas, enclaves of Germans, they were more dispersed, so they seemed less dangerous, they tended to be more prosperous, they were able to buy property, start businesses and other things, unlike the Irish. Now, it's interesting, I was reading this biography of Lincoln, and uh, Lincoln was a politician in Illinois, you know, and he talks about, or his biographer talks about, winning the German vote in Illinois in the 1840s. So the German vote was significant. You know, so this rapid immigration, and it also would not be possible without the transportation revolution. In, in many ways, this transportation revolution seems to kind of lap over all of this. Now, the last trend there, dear Kromka, is industrialization. Oh, I'm sorry to tell this earlier. And the industrialization. Industrialization, the industrial revolution. Industrialization means building factories. You know, when we have industry, what happens? There's a factory that produces a finished product. That's, that's, that's industrialization. So what we do when we industrialize is we build factories and those factories produce finished goods and products and those finished goods and products are enjoyed by the population and sold to people all over the world at one time. Industrialization has been responsible for an improvement of the standard of living of the whole world. And industrialization as we know it starts in England. England is the first place to build the factories. And the first place of factories that the British build are textile factories. Textiles become the, the industry that is significant, producing cloth, clothing, ready-made clothing. Now, America 
right, is slow to embrace industrialization. Slow to embrace it. I mean, prior to 1815, we don't have many factories in the United States. Now, it's interesting. Now, most of you would know this because remember you were a student of mine last year in the economics class. Do you recall that? I believe you sat in a similar seat. Was it the same seat? Yeah. Um, and what we, we said was, in order to, to, to have a factory, in order to have factories and to industrialize, you need the factors of production. And the factors of production are land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial talent. Now, land is what we would refer to as natural resources. You know, um, you know ores and um, you know, um, coal and minerals and you know, timber and natural resources, you know, the, 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 the raw materials that are necessary expensive to, to, to manufacture something. Labor is just workers, simple enough. Capital is buildings and machinery, you know, buildings, factories, actual buildings, and machinery. So, I mean, if you think about it, when you manufacture a finished product, what do you need? Well, you need, you know, raw materials, you need workers, and you need machines and buildings. And you combine them together and you get a finished product. But Spencer, um, the people that provide that combine them together are the entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurs are the people that combine land and capital together to produce a finished product. And so entrepreneurship is the spirit of doing that. And so in order to have factories, you need this. Well, okay, this raises an interesting question. Here's the interesting question. Don't we have these things in America prior to 1850? Don't we have natural resources? Don't we have workers? Don't we have machinery? Don't we have an entrepreneurial spirit, people that want to, to make money? Don't we have factories? Well, if we think about this a little bit, the United States is richly endowed with natural resources, but prior to 1815, they were basically inaccessible. I mean, you had coal, you had iron ore, you had these other things, but how would you extract them and transport them in order to utilize them to make products? Frank, it's going to take this to get down. It's going to take that transportation revolution to be able to access the natural resources. Labor, aren't there workers here? Well, who said, as long as there's this, the opportunity to go to the west and acquire land, as long as there's this, then labor was going to be in short supply. Labor was extremely expensive in the United States. People would rather go west and, and, and cultivate their own land than work in a dirty, dangerous factory. So you didn't have a large urban population. You didn't have a large imp uh, impoverished population that you could exploit in factories or work in factories. So you had a labor shortage and you had inaccessible natural resources and capital buildings and machinery. In order to produce capital buildings and machinery, what you need is money. You need a financial system that can support that. You need a place to borrow money, to pool money so that you can build a factory and buy expensive equipment. We don't have that in America prior to 1850. In fact, we have a mentality that's hostile to all of it. The Jeffersonian mentality is hostile. It's hostile to a financial system that would support industrialization. And it's hostile to industrialization in general. Look, the last thing is entrepreneurship. And what, the, what motivates the entrepreneur is profit. Why does somebody build a factory? Someone builds a factory to make money. Right? I mean, after all, America is, is, is capitalist, right? And in capitalism, what people do is to benefit themselves. That's the notion, right? So people would build factories if they thought they could make a profit. But prior to 1815, people that wanted to make money might be more willing to speculate on Western lands or become involved in commerce. And that's because the British had such tight control on factories and had such superior technology and equipment and the infrastructure of producing textiles and other things that Americans were just like, unlikely to want to compete with them. And if you combine that with a general hostility, the Jeffersonian hostility to industrialization, it's not surprising that America is 
virtually non-industrialized. I mean, Jefferson and his followers truly believed that American institutions and values and traditions and self-government could not survive the very transformation that we are talking about. The transformation from rural, agrarian to urban, industrial, Jefferson and his followers did not think that Republican institutions could survive that. That you could never have a Republican government in a place where people were piled up in cities and worked in factories. And the only way to protect it was to ensure that this doesn't happen. Right? Despite the fact that the potential was there. So then the question becomes this, and I'll leave you with this question. The question becomes this, what happened, right? What sparks the Industrial Revolution in the United States? Where does it come from, right? I mean, if the elements of the factors of production are there, right, um, what changes? And how does it, does it just happen, right? I mean, does it just happen? Or what happens? Well, we'll, we'll talk about that when we resume our very interesting discussion um, tomorrow. Well, thank you, Evan, for coming and taking this. I uh, don't know that we'll meet anybody tomorrow. Friday, we